Tales of Space and Time by H. G. Wells The Crystal Egg There was, until a year ago, a little and very grimy-looking shop near Seven Dials, over which, in weather-worn yellow lettering, the name of Sea Cave, Naturalist and Dealer in Antiquities was inscribed. The contents of its window were curiously variegated. They comprised some elephant tusks and an imperfect set of chessmen, beads and weapons, a box of eyes, two skulls of tigers and one human, several moth-eaten stuffed monkeys, one holding a lamp, and an old-fashioned cabinet, a fly-blown ostrich egg or so, some fishing tackle, and an extraordinarily dirty, empty glass fish tank. There was also, at the moment the story begins, a mass of crystal, worked into the shape of an egg and brilliantly polished. And at that, two people who stood outside the window were looking, one of them a tall, thin clergyman, the other a black-bearded young man of dusky complexion and unobtrusive costume. The dusky young man spoke with eager gesticulation and seemed anxious for his companion to purchase the article. While they were there, Mr. Cave came into his shop his beard still wagging with the bread and butter of his tea. When he saw these men, and the object of their regard, his countenance fell. He glanced guiltily over his shoulder and softly shut the door. He was a little old man, with a pale face and peculiar watery blue eyes. His hair was a dirty gray, and he wore a shabby blue frock coat, an ancient silk hat, and carpet slippers very much down at the heel. He remained watching the two men as they talked. The clergyman went deep into his trouser pocket, examining a handful of money, and showed his teeth in an agreeable smile. Mr. Cave seemed still more depressed when they came into the shop. The clergyman, without any ceremony, asked the price of the crystal egg. Mr. Cave glanced nervously toward the door leading into the parlor and said five pounds. The clergyman protested that the price was high to his companion as well as to Mr. Cave. It was, indeed, very much more than Mr. Cave had intended to ask when he had stocked the article and an attempt at bargaining ensued. Mr. Cave stepped to the shop door and held it open. Five pounds is my price, he said, as though he wished to save himself the trouble of unprofitable discussion. As he did so, the upper portion of a woman's face appeared above the blind in the glass upper panel of the door leading into the parlor, and stared curiously at the two customers. Five pounds is my price, said Mr. Cave, with a quiver in his voice. The swarthy young man had so far remained a spectator, watching Cave keenly. Now he spoke. Give him five pounds, he said. The clergyman glanced at him to see if he were in earnest, and... When he looked at Mr. Cave again, he saw that the latter's face was white. It's a lot of money, said the clergyman, and, diving into his pocket, began counting his resources. He had little more than thirty shillings, and he appealed to his companion, with whom he seemed to be on terms of considerable intimacy. This gave Mr. Cave an opportunity of collecting his thoughts, and he began to explain, in an agitated manner, that the crystal was not, as a matter of fact, entirely free for sale. His two customers were naturally surprised at this and inquired why he had not thought of that before he began to bargain. Mr. Cave became confused, but he stuck to his story. The crystal was not in the market that afternoon, that a probable purchaser of it had already appeared. The two, treating this as an attempt to raise the price still further, made as if they would leave the shop. But at this point the parlor door opened, and the owner of the dark fringe and the little eyes appeared. She was a coarse-featured, corpulent woman, younger and very much larger than Mr. Cave, and she walked heavily, and her face was flushed. That crystal is for sale, she said, and five pounds is a good enough price for it. I can't think what you're about, Cave, not to take the gentleman's offer, Mr. Cave greatly perturbed by the eruption, looked angrily at her over the rims of his spectacles, and without excessive assurance, 
asserted his right to manage his business in his own way. An altercation began. The two customers watched the scene with interest and some amusement, occasionally assisting Mrs. Cave with suggestions. Mr. Cave, hard-driven, persisted in a confused and impossible story of an inquiry for the crystal that morning, and his agitation became painful. But he stuck to his point with extraordinary persistence. It was the young Oriental who ended this curious controversy. He proposed that they should call again in the course of two days, so as to give the alleged inquirer a fair chance. And then we must insist, said the clergyman, five pounds. Mrs. Cave took it on herself to apologize for her husband, explaining that he was sometimes a little odd, and as the two customers left, the couple prepared for a free discussion of the incident in all its bearings. Mrs. Cave talked to her husband with singular directness. The poor little man, quivering with emotion, muddled himself between his stories, maintaining on the one hand that he had another customer in view, and on the other asserting that the crystal was honestly worth ten guineas. Why did you ask five pounds? said his wife. Do let me manage my business my own way, said Mr. Cave. Mr. Cave had living with him a stepdaughter and a stepson, and at supper that night the transaction was rediscussed. None of them had a high opinion of Mr. Cave's business methods, and this action seemed a culminating folly. It's my opinion. He refused that crystal before, said the stepson, a loose-limbed lout of eighteen. But five pounds, said the stepdaughter, an argumentative young woman of six and twenty. Mr. Cave answers were wretched. He could only mumble weak assertions that he knew his own business best. They drove him from his half-eaten supper into the shop to close it for the night, his ears aflame and tears of vexation behind his spectacles. Why had he left the crystal in the window so long, the folly of it? That was the trouble closest in his mind. For a time he could see no way of evading sale. After supper his stepdaughter and stepson smarted themselves up and went out, and his wife retired upstairs to reflect upon the business aspects of the crystal over a little sugar and lemon and so forth in hot water. Mr. Cave went into the shop and stayed there until late, ostensibly to make ornamental rockeries for goldfish cases, but really for a private purpose that will be better explained later. The next day Mrs. Cave found that the crystal had been removed from the window and was lying behind some second-hand books on angling. She replaced it in a conspicuous position, but she did not argue further about it, as a nervous headache disinclined her from debate. Mr. Cave was always disinclined. The day passed disagreeably. Mr. Cave was, if anything, more absent-minded than usual and uncommonly irritable withal. In the afternoon, when his wife was taking her customary sleep, he removed the crystal from the window again. The next day Mr. Cave had to deliver a consignment of dogfish at one of the hospital schools, where they were needed for dissection. In his absence, Mrs. Cave's mind reverted to the topic of the crystal, and the methods of expenditure suitable to a windfall of five pounds. She had already devised some very agreeable expedients, among others a dress of green silk for herself and a trip to Richmond, when a jangling of the front doorbell summoned her into the shop. The customer was an examination coach who came to complain of the non-delivery of certain frogs asked for the previous day. Mrs. Cave did not approve of this particular branch of Mr. Cave's business, and the gentleman who had called in a somewhat aggressive mood, retired after a brief exchange of words, entirely civil, so far as he was concerned. Mrs. Cave's eye then naturally turned to the window, for the sight of the crystal was an assurance of the five pounds and of her dreams. What was her surprise to find it gone? She went to the place behind the locker on the counter, where she had discovered it the day before. It was not there and she immediately began an eager search about the shop. When Mr. Cave returned from his business with the dogfish about a quarter to two in the afternoon, he found the shop in some confusion, and his wife 
extremely exasperated and on her knees behind the counter routing among his taxidermic materials her face came up hot and angry over the counter as the jangling bell announced his return and she forthwith accused him of hiding it hid what asked mr cave the crystal at that mr cave apparently much surprised rushed to the window isn't it here he said great heavens what has become of it just then mr cave's stepson re-entered the shop from the inner room he had come home a minute or so before mr cave and he was blaspheming freely he was apprenticed to a second-hand furniture dealer down the road but he had his meals at home and he was naturally annoyed to find no dinner ready but when he heard of the loss of the crystal he forgot his meal and his anger was diverted from his mother to his stepfather the first idea of course was that he had hidden it but mr cave stoutly denied all knowledge of its fate freely offering his bedaveled affidavit in the matter and at last worked up to the point of accusing first his wife then his stepson of having taken it with a view to a private sale so began an exceedingly acrimonious and emotional discussion which ended for mrs cave in a peculiar nervous condition midway between hysterics and a muck and caused the stepson to be half an hour late at the furniture establishment in the afternoon mr cave took refuge from his wife's emotions in the shop in the evening the matter was resumed with less passion and in a judicial spirit under the presidency of the stepdaughter the supper passed unhappily and culminated in a painful scene mr cave gave way at last to extreme exasperation and went out banging the front door violently the rest of the family having discussed him with the freedom his absence warranted hunted the house from garret to cellar hoping to light upon the crystal the next day the two customers called again they were received by mrs cave almost in tears it transpired that no one could imagine all that she had stood from cave at various times in her marriage pilgrimage she also gave a garbled account of the disappearance the clergyman and the oriental laughed silently at one another and said it was very extraordinary as mrs cave seemed disposed to give them the complete history of her life they made to leave the shop thereupon mrs cave still clinging to hope asked for the clergyman's address so that if she could get anything out of cave she might communicate it the address was duly given but apparently was afterwards mislaid mrs cave can remember nothing about it in the evening of that day the caves seemed to have exhausted their emotions and mr cave who had been out in the afternoon supped in a gloomy isolation that contrasted pleasantly with the impassioned controversy of the previous days for some time matters were badly strained in the cave household but neither crystal nor customer reappeared now without mincing the matter we must admit that mr cave was a liar he knew perfectly well where the crystal was it was in the rooms of mr jacoby wace assistant demonstrator at st catherine's hospital westbourne street it stood on the sideboard partially covered by a black velvet cloth and beside a decanter of american whiskey it was from mr wace indeed that the particulars upon which this narrative is based were derived cave had taken off the thing to the hospital hidden in the dogfish sack and there had pressed the young investigator to keep it for him mr wace was a little dubious at first his relationship to cave was peculiar he had a taste for singular characters and he had had more than once invited the old man to smoke and drink in his rooms and to unfold his rather amusing views of life in general and of his wife in particular mr waith had encountered mrs cave too on occasions when mr cave was not at home to attend to him he knew the constant interference to which cave was subjected and having weighed the story judiciously he decided to give the crystal a refuge mr cave promised to explain the reasons for his remarkable affection for the crystal more fully on a later occasion but he spoke distinctly of seeing visions therein 
He called on Mr. Wace the same evening. He told a complicated story. The crystal, he said, had come into his possession with other ottomans at the forced sale of another curiosity dealer's effects, and not knowing what its value might be, he had ticketed it at ten shillings. It had hung upon his hands at that price for some months, and he was thinking of reducing the figure when he made a singular discovery. At that time his health was very bad, and it must be borne in mind that, throughout all this experience, his physical condition was one of ebb, and he was in considerable distress by reasons of the negligence, the positive ill-treatment he received from his wife and stepchildren. His wife was vain, extravagant, unfeeling, and had a growing taste for private drinking. His stepdaughter was mean and overreaching, and his stepson had conceived a violent dislike for him and lost no chance of showing it. The requirements of his business pressed heavily upon him, and Mr. Wace does not think that he was altogether free from occasional intemperance. He had begun his life in a comfortable position. He was a man of fair education, and he suffered, for weeks at a stretch, from melancholia and insomnia. Afraid to disturb his family, he would slip quietly from his wife's side when his thoughts became intolerable and wander about the house. At about three o'clock one morning, late in August, chance directed him into the shop. The dirty little place was impenetrably black, except in one spot where he perceived an unusual glow of light. Approaching this, he discovered it to be the crystal egg, which was standing on the corner of the counter towards the window. A thin ray smote through a crack in the shutters, impinged upon the object, and seemed as if it were to fill its entire interior. It occurred to Mr. Cave that this was not in accordance with the law of optics as he had known them in his younger days. He could understand the rays being refracted by the crystal and coming to a focus in its interior, but this diffusion jarred with his physical conceptions. He approached the crystal nearly, peering into it and round it, with a transient revival of the scientific curiosity that in his youth had determined his choice of a calling. He was surprised to find the light not steady, but writhing within the substance of the egg, as though the object was a hollow sphere of some luminous vapor. In moving about to get different points of view, he suddenly found that he had come between it and the ray, and that the crystal nonetheless remained luminous. Greatly astonished, he lifted it out of the light ray and carried it to the darkest part of the shop. It remained bright for some four or five minutes. When it slowly faded and went out, he placed it in the thin streak of daylight, and its luminousness was almost immediately restored. So far, at least, Mr. Waste was able to verify the remarkable story of Mr. Cave. He himself repeatedly held this crystal in a ray of light, which had to be of less diameter than one millimeter. And in the perfect darkness, such as could be produced by velvet wrapping, the crystal did undoubtedly appear very faintly phosphorescent. It would seem, however, that the luminousness was of some exceptional sort and not equally visible to all eyes. For Mr. Harbinger, whose name will be familiar to the scientific reader in connection with the Pasteur Institute, was quite unable to see any light whatever. And Mr. Wace's own capacity for its appreciation was out of comparison inferior to that of Mr. Cave's. Even with Mr. Cave, the power varied considerably. His vision was most vivid during states of extreme weakness and fatigue. Now from the outset, this light in the crystal exercised a curious fascination upon Mr. Cave, and it says more for his loneliness of soul than a volume of pathetic writing could do but he told no human being of his curious observations. He seems to have been living in such an atmosphere of petty spite that to admit the existence of a pleasure would have been to risk the loss of it. He found that as the dawn advanced and the amount of diffused light increased, the crystal became, to all appearance, non-luminous, and for some time he was unable to see anything in it except at night-time in dark corners of the shop. But the use of the old velvet cloth 
which he used as a background for a collection of minerals, occurred to him, and by doubling this and putting it over his head and hands, he was able to get a sight of the luminous movement within the crystal even in the daytime. He was very cautious lest he should be thus discovered by his wife, and he practiced his occupation only in the afternoons while she was asleep upstairs, and then circumspectly in a hollow under the counter, and one day, turning the crystal about in his hands, he saw something. It came and went like a flash, but it gave him the impression that the object had for a moment opened to him the view of a wide and spacious and strange country, and turning it about, he did, just as the light faded, see the same vision again. Now it would be tedious and unnecessary to state all the phases of Mr. Cave's discovery from this point. Suffice that the effect was this. The crystal, being peered into at an angle of about 137 degrees from the direction of the illuminating ray, gave a clear and consistent picture of a wide and peculiar countryside. It was not dreamlike at all. It produced a definite impression of reality, and the better the light, the more real and solid it seemed. It was a moving picture, that is to say, certain objects moved in it, but slowly, in an orderly manner like real things, and according as the direction of the lighting and vision changed, the picture changed also. It must, indeed, have been like looking through an oval glass at a view and turning the glass about to get at different aspects. Mr. Cave's statements, Mr. Wace assures me, were extremely circumstantial and entirely free of any of that emotional quality that taints hallucinatory impressions. But it must be remembered that all the efforts of Mr. Wace to see any similar clarity in the faint opalescence of the crystal were wholly unsuccessful, try as he would. The difference in intensity of the impressions received by the two men was very great, and it is quite conceivable that what was a view to Mr. Cave was a mere blurred nebulosity to Mr. Wace. The view, as Mr. Cave described it, was invariably of an extensive plain, and he seemed always to be looking at it from a considerable height, as if from a tower or a mast. To the east and to the west, the plain was bounded at remote distance by vast reddish cliffs, which reminded him of those he had seen in some picture, but what the picture was, Mr. Wace was unable to ascertain. These cliffs passed north and south. He could tell the points of the compass by the stars that were visible of a night, receding in an almost illimitable perspective and fading into the mist of the distance before they met. He was nearer the eastern set of cliffs. On the occasion of his first vision, the sun was rising over them, and black against the sunlight and pale against their shadows appeared a multitude of soaring forms that Mr. Cave regarded as birds. A vast range of buildings spread below him. He seemed to be looking down upon them, and as they approached the blurred and refracted edge of the picture, they became indistinct. There were also trees, curious in shape and in coloring, a deep mossy green and an exquisite gray, beside a wide and shining canal and something great and brilliantly colored flew across the picture. But the first time Mr. Cave saw these pictures, he saw only in flashes. His hands shook, his head moved, the vision came and went, and grew foggy and indistinct. And at first he had the greatest difficulty in finding the picture again once the direction of it was lost. His next clear vision, which came about a week after the first, the interval, having yielded nothing but tantalizing glimpses and some useful experience, showed him the view down the length of the valley. The view was different, but he had a curious persuasion, which his subsequent observations abundantly confirmed, that he was regarding this strange world from exactly the same spot, although he was looking in a different direction. The long façade of the great building, whose roof he had looked down upon before was now receding in perspective. He recognized the roof. In the front of the façade 
was a tariff of massive proportions and extraordinary length. And down the middle of the terrace, at certain intervals, stood huge but very graceful masts, bearing small shiny objects which reflected the setting sun. The import of these small objects did not occur to Mr. Cave until some time after, as he was describing the scene to Mr. Wace. The terrace overhung a thicket of the most luxuriant and graceful vegetation, and beyond this was a wide grassy lawn on which certain broad creatures, in the form like beetles, but enormously larger, reposed. Beyond this again was a richly decorated causeway of pinkish stone, and beyond that, all lined with dense red weeds, and passing up the valley, exactly parallel with the distant cliffs, was a broad and mirror-like expanse of water. The air seemed full of squadrons of great birds, maneuvering in stately curves, and across the river was a multitude of splendid buildings, richly colored and glittering with metallic tracery and facets, among a forest of moss-like and lichenous trees. And suddenly something flapped repeatedly across the vision, like the fluttering of a jeweled fan or the beating of a wing, and a face, or rather the upper part of a face, with very large eyes, came, as it were, close to his own, and as if on the other side of the crystal. Mr. Cave was so startled, and so impressed by the absolute reality of these eyes, that he drew his head back from the crystal to look behind it. He had become so absorbed in watching that he was quite surprised to find himself in the cool darkness of his little shop, with its familiar odor of methyl, mustiness, and decay. And as he blinked about him, the glowing crystal faded and went out. Such were the first general impressions of Mr. Cave. The story is curiously direct and circumstantial. From the outset, when the valley first flashed momentarily on his senses, his imagination was strangely affected and as he began to appreciate the details of the scene he saw, his wonder rose to the point of passion. He went about his business listless and distraught, thinking only of the time when he should be able to return to his watching, and then a few weeks after his first sight of the valley came the two customers, the stress and excitement of their offer, and the narrow escape of the crystal from sale, as I have already told. Now. While the thing was Mr. Cave's secret, it remained a mere wonder, a thing to creep to covertly and peep at, as a child might peep upon a forbidden garden. But Mr. Wace has, for a young scientific investigator, a particularly lucid and consecutive habit of mind. Directly the crystal and its story came to him, and he had satisfied himself by seeing the phosphorescence with his own eyes, that there really was a certain evidence for Mr. Cave's statements, as he proceeded to develop the matter systematically. Mr. Cave was only too eager to come and feast his eyes on this wonderland he saw, and he came every night from half-past eight until half-past ten, and sometimes in Mr. Wace's absence during the day. On Sunday afternoons also he came. From the outset, Mr. Wace made copious notes, and it is due to his scientific method that the relation between the direction from which the initiating ray entered the crystal and the orientation of the picture were proved. And by covering the crystal in a box, perforated only with a small aperture to admit the exciting ray, and by substituting Black Holland for his bluff blinds, he greatly improved the conditions of the observations, so that in a little while they were able to survey the valley in any direction they desired. So having cleared the way, we may give a brief account of this visionary world within the crystal. The things were all, in cases, seen by Mr. Cave, and the method of working was invariably for him to watch the crystal and report what he saw, while Mr. Wace, who as a science student had learned the trick of writing in the dark, wrote a brief note of his report. When the crystal faded, it was put into its box in the proper position, with the electric light turned on. Mr. Wace asked questions and suggested observations to clear up difficult points, 
Nothing, indeed, could have been less visionary and more matter-of-fact. The attention of Mr. Cave had been speedily directed to the bird-like creatures he had seen so abundantly present in each of his earlier visions. His first impression was soon corrected, and he considered for a time that they might represent a diurnal species of bat, and he thought, grotesquely enough, that they might be cherubs. Their heads were round and curiously human, and it was the eyes of one of them that had so startled him on his second observation. They had broad silvery wings, not feathered, but glistening almost as brilliantly as new-killed fish, and with the same subtle play of color. And these wings were not built on the plan of bird wing or bat. Mr. Wace learned, but supported by curved ribs radiating from the body. A sort of butterfly wing with curved ribs seems best to express their appearance. The body was small, but fitted with two bunches of prehensile organs, like long tentacles, immediately under the mouth. Incredible as it appeared to Mr. Wace, the persuasion at last became irresistible that it was these creatures which owned the great quasi-human buildings and the magnificent garden that made the broad valley so splendid. And Mr. Cave perceived that the buildings, with other peculiarities, had no doors, but that great circular windows, which opened freely, gave the creatures egress and entrance. They would alight upon their tentacles, fold their wings to a smallness almost rod-like, and hop into the interior. But among them was a multitude of smaller winged creatures, like great dragonflies and moths and flying beetles, and across the greensward brilliantly colored gigantic ground beetles crawled lazily to and fro. Moreover, on the causeways and terraces, large-headed creatures, similar to the greater winged flies, but wingless, were visible, hopping busily upon their hand-like tangle of tentacles. Illusion has already been made to the glittering objects upon the masts that stood upon the terrace of the nearer building. It dawned upon Mr. Cave, after regarding one of these masts very fixedly, on one particularly vivid day, that the glittering object there was a crystal exactly like that into which he peered, and still more careful scrutiny convinced him that each one, in a vista of nearly twenty, carried a similar object. Occasionally, one of the large flying creatures would flutter up to one, and folding its wings, and coiling a number of its tentacles about the mast, would regard the crystal fixedly for a space, sometimes for as long as fifteen minutes and a series of observations made at the suggestion of Mr. Wace convinced both watchers that, so far as this visionary world was concerned, the crystal into which they peered actually stood at the summit of the endmost mast on the terrace, and that on one occasion at least one of these inhabitants of this other world had looked into Mr. Kay's face while he was making these observations. So much for the essential facts of this very singular story. Unless we dismiss it all as the ingenuous fabrication of Mr. Wace, we have to believe one of two things. Either Mr. Crave's crystal was in two worlds at once, and that, while it was carried about in one, it remained stationary in the other, which seems altogether absurd, or else that it had some peculiar relation of sympathy with another and exactly similar crystal in this other world, so that what was seen in the interior of the one in this world was, under suitable conditions, visible to an observer in the corresponding crystal in the other world, and vice versa. At present, indeed, we do not know of any way in which two crystals could so come en rapport, but nowadays we know enough to understand that the thing is not altogether impossible. This view of the crystals, as en rapport, was the supposition that occurred to Mr. Wace, and to me at least, it seems extremely plausible. And where was this other world? On this also, the alert intelligence of Mr. Wace speedily threw light. After sunset, the sky darkened rapidly. There was a very brief twilight interval indeed, and the stars shone out. They were recognizably the same as those we see 
arranged in the same constellations. Mr. Cave recognized the bear, the Pleiades, Aldebaran, and Sirius, and so that the other world must be somewhere in the solar system, and at the utmost only a few hundreds of millions of miles from our own. Following up this clue, Mr. Wace learned that the midnight sky was a darker blue even than our midwinter sky, and that the sun seemed a little smaller. And there were two small moons, like our moon but smaller, and quite differently marked, one of which moved so rapidly that its motion was clearly visible as one regarded it. These moons were never high in the sky, but vanished as they rose, that is, every time they revolved, they were eclipsed, because they were so near their primary planet. And all this answered quite completely, although Mr. Cave did not know it, to what must be the condition of things on Mars. Indeed, it seemed an exceedingly plausible conclusion that peering into this crystal, Mr. Cave did actually see the planet Mars and its inhabitants. And if this be the case, then the evening star that shone so brilliantly in the sky of that distant vision was neither more nor less than our own familiar Earth. For a time the Martians, if they were Martians, do not seem to have known of Mr. Crave's inspection. Once or twice one would come to peer and go away very shortly to some other mast, as though the vision were unsatisfactory. During this time Mr. Cave was able to watch the proceedings of these winged people without being disturbed by their attentions and although his report is necessarily vague and fragmentary, it is nevertheless very suggestive. Imagine the impression of humanity a Martian observer would get who, after a difficult process of preparation and with considerable fatigue to the eyes, was able to peer at London from the steeple of St. Martin's Church for stretches, at longest, of four minutes at a time. Mr. Cave was unable to ascertain if the winged Martians were the same as the Martians who hopped about the causeways and terraces, and if the latter could put on wings at all. He several times saw certain clumsy bipeds, dimly suggestive of apes, white and partially translucent, feeding among certain of the lichenous trees, and once some of these fled before one of the hopping, round-headed Martians. The latter caught one in its tentacles, and then the picture faded suddenly and left Mr. Cave most tantalizingly in the dark. On another occasion, a vast thing that Mr. Cave thought at first was some gigantic insect appeared advancing along the causeway beside the canal with extraordinary rapidity. As this drew nearer, Mr. Cave perceived that it was a mechanism of shining metals and of extraordinary complexity. And then, when he looked again, it had passed out of sight. After a time, Mr. Wace aspired to attract the attention of the Martians, and the next time that the strange eyes of one of them appeared close to the crystal, Mr. Cave cried out and sprang away, and they immediately turned on the light and began to gesticulate in a manner suggestive of signaling. But when at last Mr. Cave examined the crystal again, the Martian had departed. Thus far these observations had progressed in early November, and then Mr. Cave, feeling that the suspicions of his family about the crystal were allayed, began to take it to and fro with him, in order that, as occasions arose, in the daytime or night, he might comfort himself with what was fast becoming the most real thing in his existence. In December, Mr. Wace's work in connection with the forthcoming examination became heavy. The sittings were reluctantly suspended for a week, and for ten or eleven days, he is not quite sure which, he saw nothing of Cave. He then grew anxious to resume these investigations, and, the stress of his seasonable labors being abated, he went down to Seven Dials. At the corner he noticed a shutter before a bird fancier's window and then another at a cobbler's shop. Mr. Cave's shop was closed. He rapped, and the door was opened by the stepson in black. He had once called Mrs. Cave 
who was, Mr. Wace, could not but observe, in cheap but ample widow's weeds of the most imposing pattern. Without any very great surprise, Mr. Wace learnt that Cave was dead and already buried. She was in tears, and her voice was a little thick. She had just returned from Highgate. Her mind seemed occupied with her own prospects and the honourable details of the obsequies, but Mr. Wace was at last able to learn the particulars of Cave's death. He had been found dead in his shop in the early morning, the day after his last visit to Mr. Wace, and the crystal had been clasped in his stone-cold hands. His face was smiling, said Mrs. Cave, and the velvet cloth from the minerals lay on the floor at his feet. He must have been dead five or six hours when he was found. This came as a great shock to Waste, and he began to reproach himself bitterly for having neglected the plain symptoms of the old man's ill health. But his chief thought was of the crystal. He approached that topic in a gingerly manner because he knew Mrs. Cave's peculiarities. He was dumbfounded to learn that it was sold. Mrs. Cave's first impulse, directly Cave's body had been taken upstairs, had been to write to the mad clergyman, who had offered five pounds for the crystal, informing him of its recovery. But after a violent hunt, in which her daughter joined her, they were convinced of the loss of his address. As they were without the means required to mourn and bury Cave in the elaborate style, the dignity of an old Seven Dials inhabitant demands, they had appealed to a friendly fellow tradesman in Great Portland Street. He had very kindly taken over a portion of the stock at a valuation. The valuation was his own, and the crystal egg was included in one of the lots. Mr. Wace, after a few suitable, consolatory observations, a little off-handedly proffered, perhaps, hurried at once to the great Portland Street, but there he learned that the crystal egg already had been sold to a tall, dark man in grey, and there the material facts in this curious, and to me at least very suggestive, story come abruptly to an end. The great Portland Street dealer did not know who the tall, dark man in grey was, nor had he observed him with sufficient attention to describe him minutely. He did not even know which way this person had gone after leaving the shop. For a time Mr. Wace remained in the shop, trying the dealer's patience with hopeless questions, and venting his own exasperations. And at last, realizing abruptly that the whole thing had passed out of his hands, had vanished like a vision of the night. He returned to his own rooms, a little astonished to find the notes he had made still tangible and visible upon his untidy table. His annoyance and disappointment were naturally very great. He made a second call, equally ineffectual, upon the great Portland Street dealer, and he resorted to advertisements in such periodicals as were likely to come into the hands of a bric-a-brac collector. He also wrote letters to the Daily Chronicle and Nature, but both these periodicals suspecting a hoax, asked him to reconsider his action before they printed, and he was advised that such a strange story, unfortunately, so bare of supporting evidence, might imperil his reputation as an investigator. Moreover, the calls of his proper work were urgent, so that after a month or so, save for an occasional reminder to certain dealers, he had reluctantly to abandon the quest for the crystal egg, and from that day to this it remains undiscovered. Occasionally, however, he tells me, and I can quite believe him, he has bursts of zeal, into which he abandons his more urgent occupation and resumes the search. Whether or not it will remain lost forever, with the material and its origin of it, are things equally speculative at the present time. If the present purchaser is a collector, one would have expected the inquiries of Mr. Wace to have reached him through the dealers. He has been able to discover Mr. Cave's clergyman an oriental, no other than the Reverend James Parker, 
and the young prince of Boso Kuni in Java. I am obliged to them for certain particulars. The object of the prince was simply curiosity and extravagance. He was so eager to buy, because Cave was so oddly reluctant to sell. It is just as possible that the buyer in the second instance was simply a casual purchaser and not a collector at all. And the crystal egg, for all I know, may at the present moment be within a mile of me, decorating a drawing room or serving as a paperweight, its remarkable functions all unknown. Indeed, it is partly with the idea of such a possibility that I have thrown this narrative into a form that will give it a chance of being read by the ordinary consumer of fiction. My own ideas in the matter are practically identical with those of Mr. Wace. I believe the crystal on the mast in Mars and the crystal eggs of Mr. Caves to be in some physical, but at present quite inexplicable way, en rapport. And we both believe further that the terrestrial crystal must have been, possibly at some remote date, sent hither from that planet in order to give the Martians a near view of our affairs. Possibly the fellows to the crystals in the other masts are also on our globe. No theory of hallucination suffices for the facts. End of section one. The Star. It was on the first day of the new year that the announcement was made, almost simultaneously from three observatories, that the motion of the planet Neptune, the outermost of all the planets that wheel about the sun, had become very erratic. Ogilvy had already called attention to a suspected retardation in its velocity in December. Such a piece of news was scarcely calculated to interest a world the greater portion of whose inhabitants were unaware of the existence of the planet Neptune, nor outside the astronomical profession did the subsequent discovery of a faint remote speck of light in the region of the perturbed planet cause any great excitement. Scientific people, however, found the intelligence remarkable enough, even before it became known that the new body was rapidly growing larger and brighter, that its motion was quite different from the orderly progress of the planets, and that the deflection of Neptune and its satellite was becoming now of an unprecedented kind. Few people without a training in science can realize the huge isolation of the solar system. The sun, with its specks of planets, its dust of planetoids, and its impalpable comets, swim in a vacant immensity that almost defeats the imagination. Beyond the orbit of Neptune there is space, vacant so far as human observation has penetrated, without warmth or light or sound, blank emptiness for twenty million times a million miles. That is the smallest estimate of the distance to be traversed before the very nearest of the stars is attained, and saving a few comets more unsubstantial than the thinnest flame, no matter had ever, to human knowledge, crossed this gulf of space. Until early in the twentieth century, this strange wanderer appeared, a vast mass of matter. It was bulky, heavy, rushing without warning, out of the black mystery of the sky, into the radiance of the sun. By the second day, it was clearly visible to any decent instrument, as a speck with a barely sensible diameter, in the constellation Leo near Regulus. In a little while, an opera glass could attain it. On the third day of the new year, the newspaper readers of two hemispheres were made aware for the first time of the real importance of this unusual apparition in the heavens. A planetary collision, one London paper headed the news, and proclaimed Duquesne's opinion that this strange new planet would probably collide with Neptune. The leader writers enlarged upon the topic so that in most of the capitals of the world, on January 3rd, there was an expectation, however vague, of some imminent phenomenon in the sky. And as the night followed the sunset round the globe, thousands of men turned their eyes skyward to see the old familiar stars just as they had always been, until it was dawn in London and Pollock's setting, and the stars overhead grown pale. The winter's dawn it was 
a sickly, filtering accumulation of daylight, and the light of gas and candles shone yellow in the windows to show where people were astir. But the yawning policemen saw the thing. The busy crowds in the markets stopped agape. Workmen going to their work betimes. Milkmen, the drivers of news carts, dissipation going home, jaded and pale. Homeless wanderers, sentinels on their beats. And in the country, laborers trudging afield, poachers slinking home. All over the dusky, quickening country it could be seen. And out at sea by seamen, watching for the day, a great white star comes suddenly into the westward sky. Brighter it was than any star in our skies, brighter than the evening star at its brightest. It still glowed out white and large, no mere twinkling spot of light, but a small, round, clear, shining disk, an hour after the day had come. And where science has not reached, men stared and feared, telling one another of the wars and pestilence that are foreshadowed by these fiery signs in the heavens. Sturdy boars, dusky hottentots, Gold Coast Negroes, Frenchmen, Spaniards, Portuguese, stood in the warmth of the sunrise, watching the setting of the strange new star. And in a hundred observatories there had been suppressed excitement, rising almost to shouting pitch, as the two remote bodies had rushed together, and a hurrying to and fro, to gather photographic apparatus and spectroscope, and this appliance and that, to record this novel, astonishing sight, the destruction of a world. For it was a world, a sister planet of our Earth, far greater than our Earth indeed, that had so suddenly flashed into flaming death. Neptune, it was, had been struck, fairly and squarely, by the strange planet from outer space, and the heat of the concussion had incontinently turned two solid globes into one vast mass of incandescence. Round the world that day, two hours before the dawn, went the pallid great white star, fading only as it sank westward, and the sun mounted above it. Everywhere man marveled at it, but of all those who saw it, none could have marveled more than those sailors, habitual watchers of the stars, who far away at sea had heard nothing of its advent and saw it now rise like a pygmy moon and climb zenithward and hang overhead and sink westward with the passing of the night. And when it next rose over Europe, everywhere were crowds of watchers on hilly slopes, on house roofs, in open spaces, staring eastward for the rising of the great new star. It rose with a white glow in front of it, like the glare of a white fire, and those who had seen it come into existence the night before cried out at the sight of it. It is larger, they cried, it is brighter. And indeed, the moon, a quarter full and sinking in the west, was in its apparent size beyond comparison, but scarcely in all its breadth had it as much brightness now as the little circle of the strange new star. It is brighter, cried the people, clustering in the streets. But in the dim observatories, the watchers held their breath and peered at one another. It is nearer, they said, nearer, and voice after voice repeated, it is nearer. And the clicking telegraph took that up, and it trembled along telephone wires, and in a thousand cities, grimy compositors fingered the type. It is nearer. Men writing in offices, struck with a strange realization, flung down their pens. Men talking in a thousand places suddenly came upon a grotesque possibility in those words, it is nearer. It hurried along, awakening streets, it was shouted down the frost-stilled ways of quiet villages. Men who had read these things from the throbbing tape stood in yellow-lit doorways, shouting the news to the passerbys. It is nearer. Pretty women, flushed and glittering, heard the news told jestingly between the dances and feigned an intelligent interest they did not feel. Nearer, indeed. How curious. How very, very clever people must be to find out things like that. Lonely tramps faring through the wintry night murmured those words to comfort themselves, looking skyward. It has need to be nearer, for the night's as cold as charity. Don't see much warmth from it. If it is nearer, all the same. What is a new star to me? cried the weeping woman, 
kneeling beside her dead. The schoolboy, rising early for his examination work, puzzled it out for himself, with a great white star shining broad and bright through the frost flowers of his window. Centrifugal, centripetal, he said, with his chin on his fist. Stop a planet in its flight. Rob it of its centrifugal force. What then? Centripetal has it, and down it falls into the sun. And this? Do we come in the way? I wonder. The light of that day went the way of its brethren, and with the later watches of the frosty darkness rose the strange star again, and it was now so bright that the waxing moon seemed but a pale yellow ghost of itself, hanging huge in the sunset. In a South African city, a great man had married, and the streets were alight to welcome his return with his bride. Even the skies have illuminated, said the flatterer, under Capricorn, two negro lovers, daring the wild beasts and evil spirits, for love of one another, crouched together in a cane brake, where the fireflies hovered. That is our star, they whispered, and felt strangely comforted by the sweet brilliance of its light. The master mathematician sat in his private room and pushed the papers from him. His calculations were already finished. In a small white vial, there still remained a little of the drug that had kept him awake and active for four long nights. Each day, serene, explicit, patient as ever, he had given his lecture to his students, and then had come back at once to this momentous calculation. His face was grave, a little drawn and hectic from his drugged activity. For some time he seemed lost in thought. Then he went to the window, and the blind went up with a click. Halfway up the sky, over the clustering roofs, chimneys, and steeples of the city, hung the star. He looked at it as one might look into the eyes of a brave enemy. You may kill me, he said after a silence, but I can hold you, and all the universe, for that matter, in the grip of this little brain. I would not change, even now. He looked at the little vial. There will be no need of sleep again, he said. The next day at noon, punctual to the minute, he entered his lecture theater, put his hat on the end of the table, as his habit was, and carefully selected a large piece of chalk. It was a joke among his students that he could not lecture without that piece of chalk to fumble in his fingers. And once he had been stricken into impotence by their hiding his supply. He came and looked under his gray eyebrows at the rising tears of young fresh faces, and spoke with his accustomed studied commonness of phrasing. Circumstances have arisen, circumstances beyond my control, he said, and paused, which will debar me from completing the course I had designed. It would seem, gentlemen, if I may put the thing clearly and briefly, that man has lived in vain. The students glanced at one another. Had they heard aright? Mad? Raised eyebrows and grinning lips there were, but one or two faces remained intent upon his calm, gray, fringed face. It will be interesting, he was saying, to devote this morning to an exposition, so far as I can make it clear to you, of the calculations that have led me to this conclusion. Let us assume, he turned toward the blackboard, meditating a diagram in the way that was usual to him. What was that about lived in vain? whispered one student to another. Listen, said the other, nodding towards the lecturer, and presently they began to understand. That night the star rose later, for its proper eastward motion had carried it some way across Leo toward Virgo, and its brightness was so great that the sky became a luminous blue as it rose, and every star was hidden in its turn, save only Jupiter, near the zenith, Capella, Aldebaran, Sirius, and the pointers of the bear. It was very white and beautiful. In many parts of the world, that night a pallid halo encircled it about. It was perceptibly larger. In the clear refractive sky of the tropics, it seemed as if it were nearly a quarter the size of the moon. The frost was still on the ground in England, but the world was as brightly lit as if it were midsummer moonlight. One could see to read quite ordinary print by that cold, clear light, and in the cities the lamps burnt yellow and wan, and everywhere 
the world was awake that night, and throughout Christendom a somber murmur hung in the keen air over the countryside like the belling of bees in the heather. And this murmurous tumult grew to a clangor in the cities. It was the toiling of the bells in a million belfry towers and steeples, summoning the people to sleep no more, to sin no more, but to gather in their churches and pray. And overhead, growing larger and brighter, as the earth rolled on its way and the night passed, rose the dazzling star. And the streets and houses were alight in all the cities. The shipyards glared, and whatever roads led to high country were lit and crowded all night long. And in all the seas about the civilized lands, ships with throbbing engines and ships with bellying sails, crowded with men and living creatures, were standing out the ocean and the north. For already the warning of the master mathematician had been telegraphed all over the world and translated into a hundred tongues. The new planet and Neptune, locked in its fiery embrace, were whirling headlong, ever faster and faster towards the sun. Already every second this blazing mass flew a hundred miles, and every second its terrific velocity increased. As it flew now, indeed, it must pass a hundred million miles wide of the earth and scarcely affected, but near its destined path, as yet only slightly perturbed, spun the mighty planet Jupiter, and his moons, sweeping splendid round the sun. Every moment now the attraction between the fiery star and the greatest of the planets grew stronger, and the result of that attraction, invariably, Jupiter would be deflected from its orbit into an elliptical path, and the burning star swung by his attraction wide of its sunward rush, would describe a curved path and perhaps collide with, and certainly pass very close to, our Earth. Earthquakes, volcanic outbreaks, cyclones, sea waves, floods, and a steady rise in temperature to know I know what limit, so prophesied the master mathematician, and overhead, to carry out his words, lonely and cold and livid, blazed the star of the coming doom. To many who stared at it that night, until their eyes ached, it seemed that it was visibly approaching. And that night, too, the weather changed, and the frost that had gripped all Central Europe and France and England softened towards a thaw. But you must not imagine, because I have spoken of people praying through the night, and people going aboard ships, and people fleeing towards the mountainous country, that the whole world was already in a terror because of the star. As a matter of fact, use and want still ruled the world. And save for the talk of idle moments and the splendor of the nights, nine human beings out of ten were still busy at their common occupations. In all the cities, the shops, save one here and there, opened and closed at their proper hours. The doctor and the undertaker plied their trades. The workers gathered in the factories, soldiers drilled, scholars studied, lovers sought one another, thieves lurked and fled, politicians planned their schemes. The presses of the newspapers roared through the nights, and many a priest of this church and that would not open his holy building to further what he considered a foolish panic. The newspapers insisted on the lesson of the year 1000. For then, too, people had anticipated the end. The star was no star, mere gas a comet, and were it a star, it could not possibly strike the earth. There was no precedent for such a thing. Common sense was sturdy, everywhere scornful, jesting, a little inclined to persecute, the obdurate fearful. That night, at 7.15 by Greenwich time, the star would be at its nearest to Jupiter. Then the world would see the turn things would take. The master mathematician's grim warnings were treated by many as so much mere elaborate self-advertisement. Common sense at last, a little heated by argument, signified its unalterable convictions by going to bed. So too barbarism and savagery, already tired of the novelty, went about their nightly business, and save for a howling dog here and there, the beast world left the star unheeded. And yet, when at last the watchers in the European states saw the star rise an hour later, it is true, 
but no larger than it had been the night before, there was still plenty awake to laugh at the master mathematician, to take the danger as if it had passed. But hereafter the laughter ceased. The star grew. It grew with a terrible steadiness hour after hour. A little larger each hour, a little nearer the midnight zenith, and brighter and brighter until it had turned night into a second day. Had it come straight to the earth instead of in a curved path, had lost no velocity to Jupiter, it must have leaped the intervening gulf in a day. But as it was, it took five days altogether to come by our planet. The next night it had become a third the size of the moon before it set to English eyes. And the thaw was assured. It rose over America near the size of the moon, but blinding white to look at and hot and a breath of hot wind blew, now with its rising and gathering strength, and in Virginia and Brazil and down the St. Lawrence Valley it shone intermittently through a driving reek of thunderclouds, flickering violet lightning, and hail unprecedented. In Manitoba was a thaw and devastating floods, and upon all the mountains of the earth the snow and ice began to melt that night, and all the rivers coming out of the high country flowed thick and turbid, and soon, in their upper reaches, with swirling trees and the bodies of beasts and men. They rose steadily, steadily, in the ghostly brilliance, and came trickling over their banks at last, behind the flying population of the valleys, and along the coast of Argentina, and up the South Atlantic, the tides were higher than had ever been in the memory of man and the storms drove the waters in many cases scores of miles inland, drowning whole cities. And so great grew the heat during the night that the rising of the sun was like the coming of a shadow. The earthquakes began and grew until all down America, from the Arctic Circle to Cape Horn, hillsides were sliding, fissures were opening, and houses and walls crumbling to destruction. The whole side of Cotopaxi slipped out in one vast convulsion, and a tumult of lava poured out so high and broad and swift and liquid that in one day it reached the sea. So the star, with the wan moon in its wake, marched across the Pacific, trailed the thunderstorms like the hem of a robe, and the growing tidal wave that toiled behind it, frothing and eager, poured over island and island and swept them clear of men, until that wave came at last in a blinding light and with the breath of a furnace, swift and terrible it came, a wall of water, fifty feet high, roaring hungrily upon the long coast of Asia, and swept inland across the plains of China. For a space the star, hotter now, and larger and brighter than the sun in its strength, showed with pitiless brilliance the wide and populous country. Towns and villages, with their pagodas and trees, roads, wide cultivated fields, Millions of sleepless people staring in helpless terror at the incandescent sky. And then, low and growing, came the murmur of the flood. And thus it was with millions of men that night, a flight no whither, with limbs heavy with heat and breath fierce and scant, and the flood like a wall swift and white behind. And then death. China was lit glowing white. But over Japan and Java, and all the islands of eastern Asia, the great star was a ball of dull red fire. Because of the steam and smoke and ashes, the volcanoes were spouting forth to salute its coming. Above was the lava, hot gases and ash, and below, the seething floods, and the whole earth swayed and rumbled with the earthquake shocks. Soon the immemorial snows of Tibet and the Himalaya were melting and pouring down by ten million deepening, converging channels upon the plains of Burma and Hindustan. The tangled summits of the Indian jungles were aflame in a thousand places, and below the hurrying waters around the stems were dark objects that still struggled feebly and reflected the blood-red tongues of fire. And in a rudderless confusion, a multitude of men and women fled down the broad river ways to that one last hope of men, the open sea. Larger grew the star, and larger, hotter and brighter, 
with its terrible swiftness now. The tropical ocean had lost its phosphorescence, and the whirling steam rose in ghostly wreaths from the black waves that plunged incessantly, speckled with storm-tossed ships. And then came a wonder. It seemed to those who in Europe watched for the rising of the star that the world must have ceased its rotation. In a thousand open spaces of down and upland, the people who had fled thither from the floods and the falling houses and sliding slopes of hill watched for that rising in vain. Hour followed hour through a terrible suspense, and the star rose not. Once again men set their eyes upon the old constellations they had counted lost to them forever. In England it was hot and clear overhead, though the ground quivered perpetually, but in the tropics Sirius and Capella and Aldebaran showed through a veil of steam. And when at last the great star rose, near ten hours late, the sun rose close upon it, and in the center of its white heart was a disk of black. Over Asia it was the star had begun to fall behind the movements of the sky. And then suddenly, as it hung over India, its light had been veiled. All the plain of India, from the mouth of the Indus to the mouth of the Ganges, was a shallow waste of shining water that night, out of which rose temples and palaces, mounds and hills black with people. Every minaret was a clustering mass of people who fell one by one into the turbid waters, as heat and terror overcame them. The whole land seemed a wailing, and suddenly there swept a shadow across that furnace of despair, and a breath of cold wind, and a gathering of clouds out of the cooling air. Men looking up, near blinded, at the star, saw that a black disk was creeping across the light. It was the moon coming between the star and the earth. And even as men cried to God at this respite, out of the east, with a strange inexplicable swiftness, sprang the sun. And then star, sun, and moon rushed together across the heavens. So it was that presently, to the European watchers, star and sun rose close upon each other, drove headlong for a space, and then slower, and at last came the rest, star and sun, merged into one glare of flame at the zenith of the sky. The moon no longer eclipsed the star, but was lost to sight in the brilliance of the sky. And though those who were still alive regarded it for the most part with that dull stupidity that hunger, fatigue, heat, and despair engender, there were still men who could perceive the meaning of these signs. Star and earth had been at their nearest, had swung about one another, and the star had passed. Already it was receding, swifter and swifter, in the last stage of its headlong journey downward into the sun. And then the clouds gathered, blotting out the vision of the sky. The thunder and lightning wove a garment round the world. All over the earth was such a downpour of rain as men had never before seen. And where the volcanoes flared red against the cloudy canopy, there descended torrents of mud. Everywhere the waters were pouring off the land, leaving mud-silted ruins, and the earth littered like a storm-worn beach with all that had been floated, and the dead bodies of the men and brutes, its children. For days the water streamed off the land, sweeping away soil and trees and houses in the way, and piling huge dikes and scooping out titanic gullies over the countryside. Those were the days of darkness that followed the star and the heat. All through them, and for many weeks and months, the earthquakes continued. But the star had passed, and men, hunger-driven, and gathering courage only slowly, might creep back to their ruined cities, buried granaries, and sodden fields. Such few ships as had escaped the storms of that time came stunned and shattered, and sounding their way cautiously, through the new marks and shoals of once familiar ports. And as the storm subsided, men perceived that everywhere the days were hotter than of yore, and the sun larger, and the moon, shrunk to a third of its former size, took now fourscore days between its new 
and new. But of the new brotherhood that grew presently among men, of the saving of laws and books and machines, of the strange change that had come over Iceland and Greenland and the shores of Baffin's Bay, so that the sailors coming there presently found them green and gracious, and could scarce believe their eyes. This story does not tell. Nor of the movement of mankind, now that the earth was hotter, northward and southward toward the poles of the earth. It concerns itself only with the coming and the passing of the star. The Martian astronomers, for there are astronomers on Mars, although they are very different beings from men, were naturally profoundly interested by these things. They saw them from their own standpoint, of course. Considering the mass and temperature of the missile that was flung out through our solar system into the sun, one wrote, it is astonishing what a little damage the Earth, which it missed so narrowly, has sustained. All the familiar continental markings and the masses of the seas remain intact, and indeed, the only difference seems to be a shrinkage of the white discoloration, supposed to be frozen water, round either pole, which only shows how small the vastest of human catastrophes may seem at a distance of a few million miles. End of section two.